Thanks for joining us for this on-demand replay of the 2020 Scrum Guide update celebrating 25 years of Scrum. This was a live event, so to improve your viewing experience, we've shortened the breaks and removed some details that only apply to the live audience. We promise all the Scrum content remains unchanged. Finally, if you haven't already, download your copy of the updated 2020 Scrum Guide at scrumguides.org. It is currently available in more than two dozen languages and counting. Now, on with the show. Members of the Scrum and Agile community, product owners, practitioners, Scrum masters, coaches, leaders, and visionaries. Welcome to the 2020 Scrum Guide update, celebrating 25 years of Scrum. Our program begins with opening remarks from Dr. Jeff Sutherland and Ken Schwaber, and includes two moderated workshops. The first is titled, 2020 Updates, Driving Focus. The second is titled, How the Updates Impact Your Scrum. We'll wrap up with questions, answers, and closing thoughts with Dr. Jeff Sutherland. Now, on this 25th anniversary of Scrum, please join me in welcoming the two people who started it all, the co-creators of Scrum. Hello and welcome everyone. I'm Dr. Jeff Sutherland, the founder of Scrum Inc. and I'm here with a 25th reunion with Ken Schwaber to talk about the Scrum Guide. And I'm Ken Schwaber and I'm here after Jeff and I have known each other for even longer than 25 years um, and have a long-standing friendship and working relationship. But we have been working on this and software development for a long, long time. So what you're hearing is what works. Yeah, I totally agree. We, we both saw Scrum revolutionize software development, and that, that revolution continues now, I mean, we talked 10 years ago about Scrum starting to spread to every industry, you know, not just hardware, but healthcare, construction, human resources, AI. And uh, I, I, we've been talking about changing the Scrum Guide so it's suitable for every domain and every department in every company. And, and as the world has changed, and become much more sophisticated, scientific, and complex, um, that scope of complexity for Scrum gets bigger and bigger. Um, yeah. But all of this has been made possible by people like you who have a problem, have a, have a um, situation that you want to try something with, and you've heard about Scrum and you try it. And, you find that if you work hard on it, it works. Yeah, you know, there's just one Scrum framework and it's been a, a way for companies to communicate with one another across the entire organization. And now I'm hearing in different countries, as people have spread across countries, they say Scrum is the common language of work. And uh, so we want to thank everybody who's really built Scrum over many, many years. There's been thousands of people millions of people. Uh, Scrum at its core is empirical. And so all of your insights and experience are pulled into improving Scrum, making Scrum better. And that was particularly important for the 2020 version of the Scrum Guide. A couple of things that we learned is use fewer words rather than more words. More words does not simplify, it complicates. Don't entangle ideas with each other because not only won't the reader know what you're, they're talking about, but you won't remember what you're talking about. We've incorporated these lessons. We've removed the things that entangled it. We've removed things that contradict each other. We removed things that are um, too complex and as a result, we think that this is our best guide so far. When we did the very, very first guide back in 2000, geez, was it 2000 and 2001, right after the Agile Manifesto, it was 160 pages and it had seven phases. So um, this is an improvement. 
Yeah, we're down to 13 pages. I mean, I think this is just as good for a sales team now as it is for a software development team. You, you just do it. I mean, it's, it's straightforward. And if you got a problem, there it is. Um, so we've also made Scrum Guides less prescriptive. As, as we proceeded, we would get questions. Um, how do you do this? How do you do that? How, how does that happen? And it would bother us, so we would try to put something that would guide or instruct or, or give people information on how to do it. And I, I think I started it by, by the three questions you ask during the daily scrum. And then we also had, you know, how you do your refinement. Um, so we put in things that we thought would help you through difficult situations. All it did was help maybe those people, but baffle everyone else. And um, you can always tell when you're, the people are baffled because they start arguing. And if you go to discussion groups, you'll see people quibbling about things. I don't think you'll see as nearly as many as those. So Scrum itself is much, much less prescriptive. It had to be to be down to um, 14 pages or 13 pages. And so we placed a lot of effort on streamlining and on making this work in a straightforward way. Um, if that was all we had done, I would have been just, just really happy. Um, but Jeff, we also found some other things, didn't we? Yeah. <clears throat> you know, I just thought when you were talking, remember we started off, Scrum was just one team when we were writing that paper for uh, Oopsla. And then we went to individual and then they had several teams. And I, I remember we did a lot of work there. And then we went to IDX and they had hundreds of teams <laughs> and many business units. Um, and then of course we worked together at Patient Keeper for many years. Uh, and meanwhile, you were out all over the world talking to many different companies, starting the whole certification program. Uh, and so Scrum has used, been used everywhere for companies all sizes and shapes and forms. Uh, but getting that one team really right <laughs> is kind of the core of everything, right? So uh, one of the things we did with a guide was uh, simplify the sprint planning topics uh, <clears throat> and also bring in a focus on why are we doing what we're doing. And uh, uh, an introduction of the product goal, I remember, Ken, I, <clears throat> I mentioned to you about a year or so ago that some of our trainers were saying, <clears throat> the product owners are not focused on the overall goal. They don't have a vision of where they're going. So the team is supposed to know long-term where are they going, as well as for each sprint, what is the goal of that specific sprint? <clears throat> uh, so previous scrub guys described the sprint goal and definition of done without really giving them an identity. They were not quite artifacts, but were somehow attached to artifacts. With the addition of the product goal, the 2020 guide provides more clarity around this. Each of the three artifacts has certain commitments. So for the product backlog, the product goal is the commitment. For the sprint backlog, the sprint goal is the commitment. Uh, the increment has a definition of done. Uh, they all exist to bring transparency and focus towards the progress uh, of each artifact. Um. When we said that there was one team, a problem that we had heard arguments after arguments after arguments about is, um, well, the product owner is one team, but then the developers are a separate development team, and the Scrum Master kind of floats out there. And, and what you get with that is, is you wind up with what I see in, in um, sprint reviews where the product owner is pounding on the table saying, you promised me you would do this for the sprint. Why didn't you do it? If, he, if that person is part of the team, they were part of the committing to what they thought they could do. 
So this thing of you're all in this together, um, I, I think, I hope will help a lot. Well, I think, you know, this, the new Scrum Guide is, is lighter, it's simpler, it's shorter. Um, and we all need to put our heads together to actually wrap whatever we need in our environment around it uh, to make it work really well. So <clears throat> we're, <clears throat> we're really happy that all of you are here today. We have a chance to talk once again <clears throat> about the update of the Scrum Guide. Uh, we thank everyone who's contributed to it over the years. Uh, and we're thankful that it has become the, the dominant agile framework in the world, uh, both for individual teams, for many teams, uh, the most successful companies in the world are all using Scrum. So this has been an amazing journey, Ken, for me. It's, it's all the other things we've done in our life, you know, that later someone balls us out for, Finally, we did something right. <laughs> this is good. <laughs> and um, it has been a journey. And it's been something I'm very proud of and I'm proud to have worked with you on it. And I think we can share this with um, the rest of the Scrum community. And it'll make their life easier, too. So thank you all for being here. And we look forward to seeing you out there scrumming day-to-day, year-to-year, into the future. Should they be wearing scrum hats? Scrum hats? Yeah, you could You could buy little scrum hats. Back when you, yeah. when you started, remember, we had the all-black shirts that yeah. said scrum yeah, the all black shirts. on the Those back. They don't sell them anymore. Is that right? Yeah, and strangely yeah. enough, they're too small for me now. Yeah. <laughs> I don't understand how that could be. I think I still have one in my closet somewhere. Maybe I should have pulled it out for this meeting, huh? <laughs> <laughs> that would be a good one. Thank you, Ken, and thank you, Jeff. To mark the 25th anniversary of Scrum, we asked you, the Scrum community, to share your Scrum story. Here is some of what you had to say. Dear Jeff. And the other father of Scrum, Ken. 25 years ago, the two of you created Scrum, this beautiful baby. And we stand here today to, as witnesses to the impact this has had on the world. Yes, and today we use Scrum everywhere. Not only in software development and marketing departments, but literally everywhere we can. We use Scrum when we run trainings. We use Scrum in HR and R&D departments. We use it for procurement. We even use it at home to run our families. We teach leaders on Scrum. We help scale Scrum across entire organizations. And still we discover new ways and areas where Scrum can be applied successfully almost every day. Yes, what a ride it has been. <laughs> Last but not least, thank you guys so much for making Scrum public domain, letting everybody discover new and better ways of working. We salute you. Salute you. <laughs> Hi, I'm Diane Leonard, president of DH Leonard Consulting and Agile and Nonprofits. And how did Scrum change my life? I can hardly even begin to count the ways. Six years ago, my spouse and I listened to the audiobook version of The Art of Doing Twice the Work in Half the Time. And right away, I began to put the Scrum framework into my own business framework. Well, our firm works exclusively with nonprofits, and so the journey didn't end with my business. We brought it right to our clients, right to the nonprofits we work with around the world by launching Agile and Nonprofits. And so, well, Scrum hasn't just changed my life. It's changed the life of countless nonprofit professionals around the world and therefore those that they serve. Happy birthday, Scrum. Can't wait to see what happens next. My story with Scrum started in 2008. After I graduated from university, I worked in a company where the managers cajoled the developers to work until midnight and also during the weekend. So back then, I questioned myself, could there possibly be a more humane way to work in software development? So I searched for the answer and discovered a book titled The Enterprise and Scrum, authored by Ken Schwaber. I learned a lot of things about using Scrum in a large-scale enterprise from this book. Thanks to all of you who shared your Scrum story. 
We'll feature more of these throughout the program. It's now time for our first workshop, 2020 Updates Driving Focus, featuring Dave West and JJ Sutherland, moderated by Patricia Kong. Hello, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. My name is Patricia Kong. Um, now that you've had a chance to take a look at the Scrum Guide 2020, it's my pleasure for the next 45 minutes to be moderating a conversation about the Scrum Guide updates with JJ Sutherland and David West. So um, I've printed it out. Um, it went from 19 to 13 pages. So we can say that less prescription, less complex as, as Ken and, and um, Jeff mentioned in the, the, the video. Um, they touched on something. And the reason that we wanna talk about driving focus is the notion of this commitment and product goal. So uh, gentlemen, I hope you don't mind if we just jump right in. Um, sure. So, so let me start with this. So if you're with me and you're looking at the scrum guide, um, the update right now on page 11, let me just read this to everyone. The product goal describes a future state of the product, which can serve as a target for the scrum team to plan against. Um, what do you guys think is the purpose of the product goal? So I know Jeff touched on it a bit. Um, why don't we get just started into the purpose? JJ, why don't you start? Sure, I think what Jeff and Ken in conversations with them, what they really wanted to do was to make sure people were using Scrum to get somewhere, to actually deliver something, not just to do it. And I was uh, talking yesterday, I said, don't agility is not the solution to your problems. Agility is how you solve problems. And that's what I think it is. And so when you have a goal, whether it's the sprint goal is the goal for the sprint and the product goal is this broader thing, what is all those sprints and add up to? Because one of the hardest things in any part of your life is say, okay, I wanna to get to this vision, to this place, to this idea, but what do I do tomorrow? Because it might take years to get there, but I'm gonna to have to do tomorrow. And what Scrum does is it allows you to get the feedback of whether you're going on the right, in the right way very quickly. Yeah, just to sort of add to that, I guess it's it's all about striving for something, isn't it? You know, we we as human beings, I think, are ultimately more motivated if we have a picture or a context that we're striving to. You know, being told to do a task, as fabulous as that task might be, is not particularly interesting or motivating, and also it doesn't allow you to be empowered or your team to be empowered to solve that that thing in a particularly unique way. By having a clear goal in mind, it helps frame your sprint goals, it helps frame your reviews, it helps frame how you actually approach the problem and the work that you're doing, I think. I'm really excited about a goal being added. It, it's something that I've noticed, and JJ and I were talking about this a little bit, as we potter around the world, not so much now, obviously, with COVID, but we go into many Scrum teams and see them, and they've got really good Scrum boards. But the lack of clear connection with the actual outcomes, the customer, is something that, that really worries me. Uh, you know, they're great at doing work, and they may have fantastic velocity, but ultimately, they're not necessarily aligning that to the outcomes that they all seek and, and the organization seeks and and hopefully that enriches the world that, that we live in. Excellent. Um, I can't tell you how many times, Dave, when we, you were, we're talking about this, when you go into an organization, you find a bunch of teams working on stuff that no one wants. It's, and it's not that they're <laughs> bad, it's not that they're bad team owners, not even that they're bad product owners. What it is, is there's no goal. There's no connection from what a team is doing on a sprint to sprint basis and as Dave was saying, and on this broader scale, what does the organization want to achieve? So That's JJ, really you're why it's so important. What I'm wondering is then, and, and I'm seeing it come up in the questions is just why now then? Why now, if we've been seeing this for, for years, why do you think now is the, the moment? Uh, well, go ahead, Dave. No, I was just gonna say, it, it, it's funny because you know, obviously, you know, JJ and I are, are very fortunate to spend a lot of time with um, Jeff and Ken and, and talk about this. And, and I think there's always this tension about um, adding more stuff to the to the guide and 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 taking stuff out. And, and I think that before anything's really added to the goal to, to the guide, sorry, the, the, there's definitely needs to be 
a distinct need. But I think ultimately, I think it's really illustrative of the fact that so many different organizations and different types of teams are really doing Scrum now. It's a lot clearer that there needs to be something that, that unifies that team in the pursuit of something. And maybe when it was all software teams, the product backlog, you know, defects, you know, all this sort of stuff, it was much simpler. But as Scrum is used by more organizations and more types of people, it's always been about delivering value, right? It's not just been about doing work, but now it's even more apparent, I think. I don't know if you agree, JJ, but it's something that I've seen. Yeah, no, I, I think that uh, most of um, the companies that I work with are not software companies at all. They're mm. doing very different things. They're in aerospace, they're in defense, they're in oil and gas, they're in, doing lots and lots of different things. And I think that what uh, Jeff and Ken did was say, because of that, let's rethink how we do it and rephrase it. Now, I was talking to Jeff last night, and one of the things he said is he said, you know, Scrum hasn't changed. We're just getting the description better. <laughs> and I think that's really uh, what has made, made the difference is it's not that Scrum itself has changed at all, it's that Jeff and Ken are finding better ways of describing it. I mean, when we think about what that adds to the Scrum framework, right, the, the central message that you guys have is really, for me, around focus and innovation um, and, and really driving that forward. So let's get a little bit into the details then, because I'm sure as people are reading this, they're starting to think about how does this affect my role? How does this affect you know, our teams? Um, so straightforward, um, JJ, who do you say creates the product goal? Well, the product goal is the product backlog. It's what the product backlog sort of adds up into, right? So the product backlog, this is a way of describing the product goal, just like the sprint backlog is a way of describing the sprint goal. And so that, that's really where it does come from. Yeah, and, it's, and of course that means, because it's about the product backlog, it's owned by the product owner. Now, ultimately a good product owner, which uh, JJ and I might not necessarily embody at times, but we do our best. <laughs> um, a good product owner um, talks to lots of people and is trying to distill that, that product goal, you know, trying to make it so it's, you know, specific, it's measurable, it's agreed upon. And, and that is a real art. And um, it's, it can be incredibly challenging, but ultimately it comes from that product owner and it, it manifests, it's made transparent through the product, product backlog. Thank you, an art it is. So um, one of the things that I noticed and when we're talking about the role of the product owner is in the last guide, um, from 2017, there is the mention of vision once. In the 2020 guide, um, I, I do not see the word control F vision at all. So what would you say then, Dave, is a difference between a product goal and a product vision? So it, it is, yeah, so in 2017, there's that, that one statement in the guide that says, you know, how the product backlog is created because, of, you know, informed by a, a vision or, or a goal. And, uh, and obviously in this release of the guide 2020, the, that vision statement has, has gone. So ultimately, I think that in many organizations, vision, strategy, tactic, everything's a bit of a blur and it depends on context. However, you know, you could argue that a product goal comes from an ultimate organization or vision or mission. You could also argue that a product goal drives a vision, which is then manifest in the product backlog. Ultimately, the semantics uh, is all going to be very contextual in your organization, in your context, whether the vision is bigger than the goal and it describes a series of product goals or whether it's actually the other way around. And I don't think it really matters as long as it's clear for your organization. And as long as you clearly define what this, this context is um, and to make it more transparent and to understand why the goal doesn't describe everything or why the, the goal just describes this, this element of the, uh, of, of the endeavor you're, you're, you're engaged in. I, JJ, I want to also, uh, go ahead, sorry. I was just saying, I see you nodding, so. Yeah, I mean, I think what uh, the product goal becoming the organizational goal, because you're getting all this feedback all the time, is that product goal the right one to do? And I think what Jeff and Ken were really trying to do, I remember this conversation with Ken, you were there, Dave, when he said, you know, vision is almost too vague. You know, it's yeah. like, okay, I have a vision, but you have to have a goal and you have a commitment to this goal. 
And it was very interesting how they used uh, the scrum value of commitment, of saying there is a commitment to reaching this goal and the team and the product owner and the organization recognizes that, that they so, have this so let's commitment. Look at that because that's not vague, right? So, so commitment, um, JJ, what does it mean in, in your conversations with Ken and Jeff um, and your interpretation too, especially based on your experiences, what does it mean when it says that the scrum guide says that the product goal is a commitment for the product backlog? What, what was this meaning behind taking one of the, the, the scrum values and, and throwing it in like that? I think what it came from, I remember Ken in the last uh, update in 2017, he said, you know, that when he was talking about commitment, about the scrum value of commitment, he says, it's really easy to come out of sprint planning and work on something else and not what's on the sprint backlog. That's a temptation. I know I get it myself, you know, something comes up. Hey, we should do this. Oh, this is, you know, the bright shiny ball, like squirrel. But, and then, but what the commitment is meant to focus yourself. Focus yourself. I have committed to this. I'm going to get this done. Because again, that's what Scrum is about, getting things done. And, and that's the great thing about the use of the word commitment. And I don't want to overload it, but in respect to the, the, the three artifacts, you know, the definition of done, the sprint goal and product goal, the newly included. It's obviously definition of done and sprint goal were already there. But now I think you could not debate the relevance of them anymore because they are commitments, um, you know, in the terms of the definition of done, a commitment to the increment. You know, this is what an increment really means. These are its quality characteristics. This is a, this is its, you know, a, 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 a quality or capability. Commitment in the sprint that there's a clear goal that we're moving incrementally towards the product goal, which is a commitment to the product backlog. I think it's a really nice use the, um, the word. Initially, I, I must admit, I didn't like it, JJ. I, mean, I was like, hang on, we can't use it twice. You know, I'm a big <laughs> fan of things separate uh, if it means something else. But ultimately, as I've been over the last, you know, a few months, been using it in thinking and writing and, and just using the word, it makes so much sense because we're not saying we can get it done. It's not a promise, but it's an aspiration and a desire in the same way as a commitment in in uh, in the values is. Mm. So you you talked a little bit about um, just kind of all the other artifacts that we have in Scrum and and Dave, you're you're a you're a product guy. So when you talked about product vision and now we have this notion of the product goal, how do you see how do you see that relationship in terms of how we uh, would be using product roadmaps um, and other product management artifacts, let's say. Yeah, so ultimately, you know, I think it, as I said earlier, I think it really does depend on context. However, what, what I, I think that's super important about a product goal is that, that there is one at the start and that you start working towards it and then you have the opportunity to inspect and adapt it throughout. Now, if that product goal fits into a broader story, a product vision or a roadmap, then by getting continuous every you know, week, every two weeks, every 30 days, feedback from the sprint, you literally get to refine your understanding of this thing. And if you can do it, what, what it actually means to you, how what the outcomes are continuously, you get that transparency across the whole product life cycle and across the whole portfolio of product, which is, which is really, really important. I think, you know, transparency, I overuse the word, but I think it's so, so valuable. We live in this very complex environment. And, and I think COVID has, has taught us how complex it is. You know, my, my product roadmap for 2019, uh, 2020 has not been delivered on. I don't know about you, JJ, but the ability- <laughs> Oh, everything's the of, same, exactly as I say. I mean, my annual plan, perfect. Well, you are obviously clairvoyant, <laughs> um, uh, but I didn't, I'm afraid. So what, what, but what, it, what Product Goal gave us an opportunity to do is to step back from the, oh, this is what we're doing. What, what are we trying to achieve? You know, what, what are we actually in this business of? And then that allowed me to refine the product backlog and then the sprints that we deliver work at, at, at scrum.org. It allowed me to refine those uh, to, to, to be better. So I think ultimately, you know, this transparency and this flow of transparency across, across the product artifacts is super valuable. I, I could not agree more. It's the three pillars of Scrum, transparency, inspection, and adaption. 
And uh, I, was, I was thinking about this uh, last night, I was thinking about transparency. And one of the things is a lot of the work we do is imaginary. You know, we, it's not, we can't see it. We can't touch it. You know, it's in, in our heads or in the cloud or, and that makes it so hard to see where everything is. What is the state of what we're working on? And I think one of the things that, that Scrum does is sort of, it rips the imaginary into the real because uh, that is just so critical to be able to see what's going on. And that has become harder in a COVID world. You know, it's a lot easier if everyone's standing around a Scrum board. But what we've done with Scrum Inc, and I think it's really important as you're talking about changing the Scrum goals, what I've said to our trainers and consultants is saying, don't tell me what's worse about doing it online. Tell me what's better. Let's do what's better. And I think that that idea of sort of shifting the focus from our goal is not to go somewhere live to interact with somebody. Our goal is to teach people Scrum, to coach teams Scrum, to coach organizations and transform them. That's our goal. How we do that, well, we have to iterate on that. Mm. And, and that highlighted another thing, Trish, we don't mind, the measurability, you know, what is the outcome that we seek? What is in the case of, you know, if you do a training class or if you deliver a, a, an element of a product or a product to market, what is the outcome? And then that helps by thinking about that, that really helps us uh, during a sprint and particularly at sprint review to really make the intangible tangible as you said you know JJ that you know you've actually got uh, an, an outcome the, the big change in 2017 guide was the emphasis of the fact that you can release that the sprint is not a release life cycle it's actually a planning life cycle it's a it's a work life cycle it's got you know you can release as many times as you want during the sprint right now, what product goal and, and sprint goal provide us with is the ability to measure the outcome that the work that we're doing gets. Now, ideally, that's released, you know, or, or made available or is usable, as it says in the guide now. We've dropped the word released as well, I noticed. Usable. You have this element of work that's usable and you get that feedback at the sprint review. Everybody comes and talks about it. That's awesome as well. You've literally made something that was just an idea you know, a week ago, something's happened and you get to review it and talk about it. Now, hopefully that's a positive thing. Sometimes it's a negative thing, but ultimately you've learned something, which is a positive thing, which you then feed back into the next cycle, right? That's the great thing about Scrum. And goal, product goal, double downs on that. Double downs? Double, down, double, double, <laughs> double downs down. on that. So that's a very hard word to say in the, or phrase to say in the morning, isn't it? So you guys have both hit on... Um, the power of transparency and the importance of transparency. And it talks about, you know, the, the product goal is in the, the product backlog and the new guide. And um, this week, two friends have reminded me that transparency is not just about being visible, but about what's, um, what's understood. So this brings us back to focus, right? Because it's about what we're focusing on. And another thing that in the Scrum Guide, the new Scrum Guide, it says uh, the product goal, again, page 11, the product goal is the long-term objective for the Scrum team. They must fulfill or abandon one objective before taking on the next. So JJ, I'm wondering um, in, your, in your experience and your work at Scrum Inc, what does it look like when you're thinking or you've been thinking about a product goal? How would that change? How would, how would we know what would make a product goal change? if you get feedback that you're making the wrong thing, because that happens all the time, right? You have, like, I've certainly had this, you know, have, you know, I have a vision, I have a great idea, I have a goal, and I bring it to a team and the team says, okay, let's turn this into a backlog and working with the team, we do that. And then the team goes out and starts building it and giving it to real customers to get real feedback. And then they come back and they say, JJ, that was a stupid idea. <laughs> so we shouldn't do that anymore. And what's great about Scrum is like, fantastic. Now we've learned not to do that let's do something else. And I think one of the things you really focus, focused on there was the focus of the team, not doing more than one thing at a time. I know that if I have a team and they focus really hard on two really important things, neither of them will get done that quickly. Now there's always something in your backlog that's you know just the business as usual, keeping the lights on stuff that you have to, you know, just have to do. Like, you know, you have to do certain things all the time, no matter what. But the idea is drive that down into just what's the minimal viable stuff in your backlog that you have to do that isn't innovation, creation, uh, do it solving the problems that you're trying to solve. And you want to minimize that. And so this is the idea of the focus. And if you do two things at once, 
it doesn't work that well. It, it is interesting when, when you discover, there, there's, there's always balance in any of these things, right? But so when you discover, which you quite hopefully rapidly do discover that the thing that you, you that amazing idea that you had, JJ, was that actually just rubbish. Um, but you, <laughs> when you discover that, not saying any of your ideas are rubbish, I'm sure they're all awesome. But when you discover that, you get the opportunity to do, you know, a couple of things. You get the opportunity as a product owner to say, oh my God, stop kill the sprint that's it I'm going to go back to the drawing board I'm going to talk to the people that invested in me and invested in this team and decide what to do or we have the opportunity to refine to change it right you know this it, it, we have the ability to say yeah JJ your idea was a bit rubbish but what we found was if we do this and this and this they actually loved it you're like oh and then this is the other realization that this sort of highlights a lot of people think of the product owner as the voice of the customer, that sort of gatekeeper that manages all of the desires of the, the world outside of the team, when realistically the team ultimately has a responsibility to take those, yes, we're making decisions as a product owner on what order to, uh, to do things, what direction to go, what goal to execute on. But ultimately it's the team's responsibility to validate that, to challenge that, and to bring back that feedback to, to allow us to make better decisions. Everybody cares about the increment. Everybody cares about delivering the value. Everybody cares about that. Yes, the product owner happens to have the responsibility for making the ultimate choices uh, around which to do first or what direction to, to go, but the whole team is responsible for challenging, in this case, JJ, when he comes up with a, a silly idea, and then working on building the you know the helping improve refining the 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 goal to improve so the next sprint that we go along or even in this sprint we actually move in in a better direction and i think that's a really important point and to some extent not that we're meant to be talking about this the removal of the development team or the renaming the development team to developer has helped us so you add that with the goal it really highlights the fact that we've known forever uh, but it's sometimes missed, is that Scrum is all about delivering value. It's not about well, doing how, 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 I mean, a little tangent, we have, uh, we have 20 minutes. How does that help us? How does what help us? That we're all focused on delivering value? The change from development team to developers. So I, I think ultimately, to some extent, Scrum is still Scrum. Don't, don't get me, but having a team within a team and having this sort of almost contractual relationship between the product owner and that development team. And of course, that's not how many people practiced it, particularly the good people, but ultimately got in the way of value. You know, the team just carried on doing what the product owner said, in, even if it didn't necessarily deliver the value because the product owner is responsible for value. JJ is the one that gets beaten by the by the board and by the people investing not me i'm the development team i delivered it look at my velocity look at my burn down you know etc <laughs> i think that this highlights and obviously i'm saying this as a product owner you know that though i make the decisions everybody is accountable for them great um no what it means that we're as a team we are responsible for this and i think that you know one team uh, i think ultimately is a really good positive positive change. Um, but of course, as, as JJ said, people that are doing Scrum today well, this doesn't change it. You go into a really good organization that's doing Scrum, they was, everybody cares about the value. Everybody's challenging their understanding of the, the PBIs, the product backlog items and the, and, the, and the sprint items and the sprint goal and trying to deliver the most value to the customer. Everybody has that hill that they're trying to climb, right? Everybody gets it. The teams that don't function effectively are ones where the product owner is telling people what to do. And, and I think though, though that was never the intention of Scrum, I think sometimes you could, you could mistake that. And um, so I'm really excited about this. I, I like that change. I don't know, JJ, it's a little, maybe it's a little tangent, but I, I really think it all fits with this goal sort of value orientation that the, the Scrum guys really embraced massively in this release. 
Yeah, I was uh, speaking, I heard of, uh, speaking with a, um, uh, a fairly high level official in uh, Britain the other day, yesterday, and he said cool. something really interesting. He said uh, that before he did Scrum, he said he'd been on in his life two or three really high performing teams, like really great teams where everything clicked, everybody worked together well. He said it was the best thing ever, but it all happened by accident. And he says, but he doing now with Scrum, he says he is able to build teams on purpose with consciousness. And I think that idea of the Scrum team as a whole, that there is no separation of the product owner and the Scrum master and the developer, they're all together as the Scrum team, working together towards this common goal, this common product goal. And that is doing it on purpose and trying to build these high performing teams consciously. Uh, yes. Um, Sorry, oh. I was going to say yes. Okay. <laughs> I just Let's got touch. excited, Patricia. Sorry. Let's touch on that, JJ. So, so you're talking about focus, transparency. You've talked about essentially um, the the person you were talking about, the intention, right? So, one of the things that product goal um, that that may be interesting for for people, especially larger organizations, but most organizations, to think about is now about alignment. So if we were talking about um, product goals, is there a need for organizations to ensure that there's alignment um, with product goals and strategic goals? And what would you think that would look like in your experience? Ab absolutely. I mean, in a, in a sort of perfect world, there is this broad goal of the organization, this is the strategic direction we're moving in. Everybody, even hundreds of teams, any team member should be able to say, I know how my task, the thing I'm working on today helps that, that it, it's all additive up. And that doesn't matter if you're in a small startup or if you're like, I don't know, like Bosch or somebody with 300,000 people. It, it's, you know, how does what I'm doing today align with the organization's strategic goals? Because that's what happens when things aren't transparent in this And when those aren't really clear. And as you were saying, Trish, that they're understandable. Everyone shares a common understanding of what those goals are and what those mean for my daily work. So yes, you want everything. If you have a portfolio, you're gonna have a few different ones, but everything should add up together. I think the most successful organizations, there is that clear alignment between strategy and the goals that every, every product and every product backlog manifests. I think the, the, the challenge is that it means that we have to make choices. And I think that most large organizations that I've come into contact with have a really hard time making choices, have a really hard time focusing because they want to do it all because they don't know. We, uh, one of the manifestations of living in a complex world is we don't know. So the, the one strategy in response to that is do everything because <laughs> just in case, because one of them will work, right? And that, <laughs> what that ends up meaning is that there isn't a clear focus for the company, that the strategy is either very intangible and like, well, we're gonna be the best of this. Well, what does best mean? Well, you know, you, you, it, it, it isn't tangible. It doesn't, it isn't, it isn't real. And then me working in a, as a cog in a very big organization like a, you know, a Bosch or a, you know, or whatever, I don't really understand how my contribution fits in and that demotivates me. And then, you know, that ultimately results in me not delivering the value that I can. One of the, one of the things that's super interesting about this sort of the, 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 uh, the use of Scrum is that ultimately it challenges the fundamental ideas about how work is done. You know, it's taken Taylorism and in the industrial viewpoint and sort of turned it on its head and said, hang on a minute, actually the most important people aren't the managers, the bosses, the C-levels, even you know, people like me, it's actually the people doing the work and, and they need to know why they're doing it. And they need to ultimately break down those, that, that barrier and have it clearly communicated. And so we've seen with, the, with, the, with COVID, one thing that's an interesting piece of data that I saw recently from a study uh, I believe it was McKinsey, where they showed the sort of communications between the high level executives and teams, the people that are actually doing the work has increased massively because of, because of COVID. 
because ultimately it's very clear that when as a massive amount of unknown it's very clear that you go and tell people why they're what they're doing is so important as they're sitting in a house with kids on you know zoom doing education where they're worried about their parents and everything this is why this is important it it, it it's very clear and what scrum does is it institutionalizes it it makes it that this is you have to clearly have a goal. You have to, and ideally it connects to the strategic goal and it flows all the way down. So I think ultimately the, you, the, the connection it has to be very clear. It has to be aligned and communicated mm. in that way. So I, Dave, I just want to pick up on one, one of the things you said there, prioritization. <laughs> People Enjoy. hate prioritizing because they have to choose. And yeah. so they say, as you were saying, they'll, they'll want anything. Uh, and the thing is, if you have five top priorities, which is usually what most organizations I go into, I'm sure you probably have the same experience. If everyone has like five top priorities, which is oh, just yeah. silly. Because if you have five or more top priorities, the person deciding on your corporate strategy is the most junior person in your company because they get to pick what to work on. Because <laughs> they get to pick. Because you said everything's important. And it's this constant idea of saying, and what I, I think in the product goal, it says, you focus, as, as the new guy says, focus on one thing at a time and you'll get it done. If you focus on 10, you have like 10 halfway done things of zero value. A lot of work. Everyone's been busy. Everyone's worked hard, right? But nothing is actually done. I was, yeah. uh, before I was in this business, I was a, a broadcaster for National Public Radio, NPR, sort of our version of the BBC in America. And I was running the morning show at one point and this young producer came up to me and said, JJ, I worked so hard on this piece. I stayed up all night. It took hours and hours and hours. And I said, how much do you think the listener cares how hard you worked? <laughs> because they don't <laughs> care at all. They only care what comes out of the box. They only care what's delivered to them. And so you want to do is deliver that product with the least amount of work that you can do but do they have the quality and the speed? Because that's where you learn. It's a, exactly, and that, yeah. So I, the, best, the, the best example is when you've managed to deliver your product goal and everybody loves it and everybody's like, yeah, and, you, and you've still got 28 PBIs still in your product backlog. By the way, 28 was just a random number. I didn't mean that on purpose, but you've still got work because what that means is that your team innovated it, it, it's, you know, what that means is that everybody was so focused on delivering the goal. They, and yes, the, the PBIs that they created were probably their idea of it, but they realized as they did more work that some of those things didn't make sense. And that's the great thing. It, you know, it's not, can you get everything done that's in the backlog? It's, can you deliver the value that the backlog is all about? And, and I think that's super, super important. You know, we, we often talk around sprint planning, <laughs> the sprint goal really frames not just the, the things that we pick out and put into the sprint backlog, but it means the things that we don't put. It means it gives us the ability to sort of like innovate around those things to deliver what we can to get the, the goal out. And, and I think that's, that's something that we often forget as we, because we can't help but forget because it's that, you know, it's your 27th sprint You've been working through this backlog. You know what it's like. You just sort of forget, why am I here again? You know, what are we doing? The great thing about a product goal, because it will be manifest and transparent at the sprint review, at sprint planning, even the daily scrum, you know, that making it, it's there, it's on the wall or the virtual wall now, obviously. And everybody's like, oh, how did that help? I know it's, it's the most rewarding and annoying thing. So Ken Schwaber says to me, every time we meet, so how are we doing against our goals? Let's talk about the, and, and I'm like, I just want to tell you about the work I did because it was so awesome and I worked so hard on it. A bit like your uh, your NPR guy, uh, who's probably awesome and doing a really hard job. So we do we do respect him for that. And, you know, I want to tell Ken how amazingly hard I've worked. And he's like, I don't care. I care about the outcomes. How did you, how did you do that? I'm like, ugh, damn. How did you do it, guys? That well, actually, it was a complete flop. All right, but so I worked really hard, so you should reward me for it. <laughs> exactly. Dave and you also, JJ. All right, so we've gone through the purpose of the product goal. We've talked about focus and transparency. What I'm hearing you guys now say, you know, when you're thinking about that product goal and how it drives focus, 
that's really helping an organization innovate because what it's forcing you to do is not really just say yes, it's forcing you to say no, right, to drive that. So we've gone through that. And now you know this question is here, it's coming um, for both of you, is what, what are some examples <laughs> of product goals that you've seen? Very quick. I, yeah, yes, I mean, <laughs> so I've, I've got a few, you know, sort of like reach 10,000 new users, um, yeah, uh, Im improve the customer experience as measured by the NPR, uh, not NPR, sorry, net, uh, promoter score, MP <laughs> NPR is obviously a radio station, but um, to add 20 points on our experience numbers or whatever, you know, very, very focused, very specific, very measurable, agreed upon, realistic, has some, may maybe within a time frame is also a nice extension around this. I, you know, I've seen lots of those. I've also seen some very bad ones that are very intangible. I personally like very, very tangible goals uh, that I can understand that have a clear measurement, but I also don't like them. Instead of making a choice, they've sort of added 15 goals and merged it into a really long sentence. So I like it when there's a choice. I like it when it's measurable. I like it when it's succinct. Um, and I like it, I guess it's a bit like, I want to lose 10 pounds um, by, um, let's say, uh, December 20th. Um, that's very measurable. It has a clear idea. It would be nice if it said why. I want to lose 10 pounds because I want to look good on my holiday photos. Okay, that's good. So I could look good by, you know, having a, a nose job or something instead. That's an alternate strategy, right? And then each sprint, maybe the first sprint is I give up drinking a bottle of wine every night. It's a ridiculous idea, but let's do it. Easy to measure. You know, <laughs> it's that kind of thing that we want to see. And it gives us some flexibility when we realize that in this current age and having two small children at home, and I know JJ's the same, giving up alcohol is not going to be a solution to weight loss. <laughs> so the, you know, it, but ultimately, I, I think specific, measurable, very important, has a clear time frame in mind. Those things are the characteristics, I would say. I don't know, JJ, any... Well, I, 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 I would agree with you, but it can also be other things. So I was thinking about uh, when COVID started, one of, uh, one of Scrummy's clients, it's a you know, fairly large company, and the CEO said, we're going to pay our ve small vendors within three days of invoice. Whoa. Because yeah, yeah. he knew that these small vendors are going to have this massive cash crunch because of COVID. And the accounts payable team, which we had been working with for a while, and they were a Scrum team doing, writing checks. And their goal was within a sprint, and they were doing one week sprints, within a sprint, we have the capacity to be able to deliver on the small vendor checks within three days, which I think there, it was usually like net 60 or net 90, right? And because they could focus on that, and they said they really attributed their ability to do that because of Scrum, they said, that's the goal. Mm. That's the only thing we're going to work on. You know, the large vendors, well, we can, they can wait till next week while we figure out the system to do this, which we haven't done before because that focused them, because that was the goal. And the goal was there, as Dave was saying, is why? And the CEO said, CEO said this is the goal, is to, get, to be able to do this, and this is why, because we know that these small companies will go out of business if they don't have cash. So I thought that was a really interesting way of thinking about it. You know, we want this capability, because it doesn't, a product is not necessarily something, you know, this tangible that you can use. Sometimes it's a capability, yeah. or it's knowledge. Or it's uh, what's the right question to ask? It can be any of those things. And uh, that what the goal is, is what do you want to be able to do? What do you want your customers to be able to do? What experience do you want them to have? Whoever's right, getting value. Minutes left. So I want to make sure I squeeze in one more question and then, and then we'll have to start to wrap this up. Um, we could sit here probably for hours and talk about this. Um, JJ, what is, what is one misconception that you think people will have about commitments in the product goal? Just one. Uh, I, <laughs> I think it's the same one that if people, as, as Dave was saying earlier, if management goes around saying, well, this was the goal, did you hit the goal? And then you learned something, you did something different than the goal, you're a bad team. You didn't meet your commitments rather than saying, no, we learned. We learned what the right thing to do is and it might not have been that. And uh, like one company I know, this, the, uh, the development teams would have to commit 
to something that the business wanted. And then a year later, they finally got around to it, but the business even didn't want it anymore. But the PMO judged them on whether they did what they committed to a year ago, even though yeah. it's a zero value. And so that's the real thing, because the entire thing about Scrum is you get to change your mind. Yeah, I think that is a, <laughs> yes. It's also how people misinterpret commitment in the values as well. So it's interesting you bring that up. They're like, but I committed, Scrum committed. I committed to doing something impossible, which is, which is great. I think that, um, <laughs> or in, in the case of the product goal, it's not impossible, it's un invaluable or not valuable as it were. I think that is a big, a big misconception. I think the other thing is like, because there's, they, people want to cheat. So they, you know, we focus on one product goal, right? So what I think another misconception is that means we can build really long sentences and use lots of semicolons and, and those things to get this. I think that that is going to be something that people do and it ends up sort of like not adding that much value. One thing that's, you know, people often discard the sprint goal. I don't know if you see this, JJ, but they discard it because they're like, well, it's not really adding any value. So we're doing what Scrum teaches us and throwing things out. By the way, that's not Scrum anymore, but it doesn't matter. Um, they, they, so they're like, because it's hard. I'm like, really? Well, because you had to make choices and decisions and focus the team and, you know, these things. Well, yeah, that's hard. Yeah. You know, it's like uh, it's like my weight loss program. That I yes, okay. having We're to make a decision. Oh, it's not. <laughs> Dave, you'll be okay. So we have a few minutes left, and um, if we lift this up, so Scrum turned twenty five this year. Happy birthday! Um, younger than than all three of us. Uh, for each of you, if you could give us a minute, what are your what are your big takeaways for the updated version of the Scrum Guide? And I'm going to add not only what your big takeaways, but what do you think that means for the future? The future of work, the future of Scrum. Um, and I'll give each of you um, a minute because unfortunately that's all we have. So JJ, what does this mean for you? What's your big takeaway? My big takeaway, and I'm so glad that Jeff and Ken did this, is that they recognize Scrum while it was birthed in the software business is being used everywhere. And I think that was one of the real uh, goals that they had because they felt that the, the guide, which was great, but it, it's, they used terms that they thought maybe that was too limiting in, into a technology uh, enterprise instead of like services or whatever, hardware, whatever it is. And so I think that that is my big takeaway from this guide. It's yeah. that the idea that Scrum can work anywhere. And I wanted, I was explaining this up. I just want to read my favorite sentence in the guide, two sentences. The Scrum framework is purposefully incomplete, only define the parts required to implement Scrum theory. Scrum is built by the collective intelligence of the people using it. That's really important because it's really about the team. It's not gonna tell everyone everything to do. And that's on purpose. That's on purpose. Dave? Just to add to that, I think, uh, I mean, that was really well put, JJ. I think going back to its roots, really. I mean, ultimately, you know, when you talk about, I don't know if you do, JJ, but you talk to Ken and Jeff about, you know, the patient keeper and these projects back in the day, the FBI Sentinel project, which sounds a bit scary. Um, <laughs> they, um, the, they, they talk about basically the, the beauty of this team focusing on things and that all the other stuff is just noise and, you know, the three questions and that. So it's going back to its roots. It's going back to the essence of getting teams to be those best teams you ever worked with, getting, getting back to that, those pure, simple ideas around it. Now, does this require intelligence? Yes. Does this require you to make tough choices? Yes. But all the best outcomes do. You know, if it was easy, everybody would be doing it, right? So you as this team, you can do it. You can literally take this framework, read the Scrum Guide and start delivering valuable stuff challenging the status quo and improving the world that you live in and create an environment that is both productive and also incredibly happy. And that, and that, I think that's the essence of Scrum. And I think that's what we've managed in this, um, Ken and Jeff have managed in this release of the Scrum Guide to get back to. They've gone back to their roots and it's awesome. Mm. On that note, um, 
Thank you everybody who's watching, who's participating. Uh, you're all out there who have to do the hard work. And I wanna thank you, of course, our speaker. So thank you, JJ, thank you, Dave. Um, and we'll be, uh, we'll be in touch with more questions for you both at, uh, at your company. Thank you, everyone. Thanks. Thank you, Trish. Bye-bye. Let's again take a moment to celebrate the 25th anniversary of Scrum by hearing more of your Scrum stories. Tudo bem, pessoal? Tô fazendo um videozinho aqui bem rapidinho para comemorar os 25 anos do Scrum que acontece esse ano. Então tem um minutinho, vamos lá. O Scrum mudou a minha vida, tá? Eu era um mero analista de testes, né? E, e aí quando eu descobri o Scrum, eu falei, vamos, vamos ver o que é isso, vamos começar a trabalhar com isso. E eu descobri uma nova maneira de trabalhar melhor, mais rápida, mais eficiente, mais importante de tudo, mais divertida, né? É, e aí eu comecei a galgar cargos, né? No sentido de fui Scrum Master, fui PO, cheguei a atuar um pouquinho como Agile Coach, e aí me deu uma luz de que, putz, a gente não tá fazendo Scrum da maneira correta. E aí eu corri atrás de me tornar trainer de Scrum, e aí eu tive a oportunidade de conhecer o Jeff Sandlin e outras pessoas muito boas no meio da agilidade, isso mudou ainda mais a minha vida para me tornar o profissional que eu sou hoje, que eu acredito que com um pouco de conhecimento que eu tenho, eu tenho ajudado várias pessoas a implementar o Scrum de forma correta. Muito obrigado e feliz 25 anos! I'm Usha, an Agile coach at Cognizant and passionate about Scrum. My journey with Scrum began 20 years ago in 2000, when I didn't know what Scrum was. Now, 20 years later, I have coached different types of teams in different organizations. And what I see now is that Scrum is really like a palette of colors. Each organization, each team represents a different shade and more get added to it as the teams inspect and adapt. So wish you a very happy 25th anniversary Scrum. Hope to see more and more colors getting added to your palette and my journey with you continues. It was December 2002 at the date of fighting in an arbitration. It was finally over and I asked myself this question. Why did I fail? It was a large complex enterprise project and we spent weeks preparing the perfect plan with all the detail up front and months of developing one stage by another stage. It was a perfect waterfall and we ended up in arbitration. Why? Months later, my brother called me and said, hey, search for something called Scrum. And I'm like, what? Can you spell it for me? And that was around year 2005 or six. Since then, all the team I train and coach, we use Scrum. We deliver, we deliver what customer love, no turning back to Father 4 for me, it's all scrums. Remember, they are rocks at the bottom of the waterfall and they will hurt you. My name is Andrew Lin. This is my Scrum 25 story. Thank you. Thanks again to everyone who shared their Scrum story. Let's begin our second workshop, How the Updates Impact Your Scrum, featuring Avi Schneier and Don McGrail, moderated by Kevin Ball. Thank you, Tom, and good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Scrum Guide Update. As mentioned, we are talking about how the updates impact your Scrum. Don, good morning. Avi, how are you? Good morning. Great. Let's say morning, a lot of cool questions. Good morning. A lot of great questions are coming in, but I want to kind of kick off the conversation and ask you both a question. Avi, you could respond first. What would be the biggest challenge for people using Scrum? The biggest challenge for people using Scrum, I think, happens uh, really when they first adopt it. I think that's where the biggest challenge is because like, the difficulty is, is that they're used to doing something one way and then all of a sudden they want to do Scrum and they try to map it in a one-to-one -one fashion. And traditional project management and running a team with Scrum don't necessarily map one-to-one. -one. And so that causes a tremendous philosophical confusion for them and they're not quite sure how to proceed. I think that's the biggest challenge that I, I see is during the adoption phase. Uh, when they are um, already using Scrum, I think the, the biggest challenge is their interface with parts of the organization that might not be using Scrum or understand agile ways of working. I think that's where I see that. Don? Um, yeah, well, something that this, uh, this Scrum guide uh, hopefully 
um, helps with is is that I think was they were talking a little bit about about it in the last session was the the lack of product vision. You know, we look at it as just time, budget, scope. Let's get to work. Let's get our stuff done. Um, and I think that's going to be the hardest thing that for people to get used to with this new version as well. It's like, okay, what's our product goal? Let's start thinking about this. It's not just about getting all our, all our things in the list done by a certain date. It's, are we actually creating any value? And who are we creating the value for? Mm. Um, that's the main thing. Yeah, thank you, Don. Sorry. I uh, just responded to some of the questions, a, a direct question for, for, for you, Ivan, and Don, you can pitch in as well. You know, what are some examples of the Scrum Guide being less prescriptive this time? And, and why is that a good thing? Don, why don't you go first for this question? Yeah, I mean, there's there's a few, right? Um, I guess the, the main one is dropping those questions, the three questions in the daily Scrum, right? You know, they're fine, but, you know, teams have been doing it for a while. They don't need those, right, to create a plan. Um, there's lots of ways to plan your day. Um, and so dropping those is key because they became kind of gospel in a way. Um, what else? There, there, I think there was like a half a page around cancel, how to cancel the sprint or what happens if you cancel a sprint. I think that's reduced to maybe a sentence or two. Um, I think as well, there were things around adding a description and uh, estimates and, and value to a product backlog item, all good things. But, you know, a lot of companies we work with, it just may not apply to their particular product backlog. So a lot of that was kind of watered down a little bit and giving it lot, gives everybody a little bit more flexibility. I, I agree with I agree with Don totally. I think uh, the idea of it being less prescriptive is incredibly important when you begin to adapt to using Scrum into multiple domains beyond IT. There are just different practices that are beneficial outside of that domain. And if you, if you have a guide that's very, very prescriptive and you think you have to shoehorn yourself into that, then you think, oh, well, then we're not gonna do any of this other stuff, which was essential. So we need to be, make sure that the framework is open and flexible so that we can incorporate what worked before into what it is we're doing now. Again, it's not gonna map one to one, but we've, we've gotta make sure that we keep what's good and then take advantage of using scrums so that we can really optimize our delivery of valuable outcomes for our customers and stakeholders. Is, I think it's really important to know as well and make it clear that just because they're no longer in the scrum guide, it doesn't mean it's not a good thing, right? One that occurred to me just now was, was the um, putting a retrospective action items into the sprint backlog. That was in the 2017 version, a great practice. I love you know, giving it that sort of attention. Um, it's no longer in this one, but doesn't mean you shouldn't do it. It's a good idea, but that's a team decision. So there's still some good things, yeah. And gentlemen, you, you were really talking about you know a switch uh, from not being really super prescriptive. But what's the best way for teams and companies to actually kind of adopt that and adopt that mindset? Because we had the previous guide. Some people did obviously try to shoehorn themselves in. Now we have some little bit of different language in the next guy. What's the best way to approach that? Well, I think I think what Don said uh, as he was talking about the earlier session, where it's really about. What, what should be your product vision, which uh, in our guide, you know, we're talking about the product goals. I think it's really important for everyone to understand that when you're beginning the outset of creating your products or embarking on new projects, that you are starting with some kind of a North Star, however you want to term it, that everyone is aligned to that says, okay, that's what we're going for. And then to use that specifically, really to use that specifically as a way to determine, hey, when we are coming up with new work items, do they align to this? And if they don't, this is a great time for the product owner to exercise that word, no, and to keep creating a line backlog for the team to, to do without being distracted in the multiple directions. Yeah, it's worth repeating it. it I think it's been said a few times already during these sessions is, is it's still a scrum, right? Um, so getting into these changes, these new scrum guide changes, I would say that the people that were doing Scrum and getting a lot of value from it, not much changes at all for them. Um, I think the big focus is for a lot of groups that are using Scrum going through the practices, but not seeing the value. Um, and so, you know, a good teams always had a product goal. You know, they always had a vision, whether it was maybe not written down the same way or maybe not as measurable as it could have been, but good teams had that. Good teams had that flexibility. Good teams did work as one team, um, one complete Scrum team. Um, so it shouldn't seem that different for, yeah. for teams that have been doing Scrum for a while. And, and good teams also had rigorous definitions of done. 
Yeah. So that's not, you know, it's my favorite thing done in the new guide is how we're calling out, calling them out specifically as commitments. Like that's my favorite part. I love the fact that the definition of done is now a commitment. This is something you're going to do. And the best teams always had it. So yep. if them, it's not really going to make a lot of difference. But I think the important part is that where we call it out directly as a commitment, we're constantly reminding that if you, you want to have work done and that it doesn't fail in a sprint or it doesn't fail after a sprint, because, you know, a lot of people aren't, aren't always so clear that scrum is just as much about quality, quality work as it is about valuable outcomes, but valuable outcomes that are functional. Yeah, that the items you're making are functional. So having that definition done in there as a commitment is really very important that we're highlighting that now, as opposed to just kind of being a, a, a small section in the in the past guide. Now it's really, really shining the light on that. Yeah, and then Avi, how do we bake that in into you know, our, 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 our sprints for the week or the two week sprint? How do we actually bake that in and make it a permanent thing? Like you said, and just before, which is something that we wanted to do, but now it's a commitment. Yeah, so there's a lot of ways to make sure your definition of done is baked into whatever it is you're doing. Uh, for some teams, for example, they're putting it inside whatever team working agreement that they have. The team agrees this is the definition of done for all the stuff that we do. And, you know, before before COVID, it would, you know, sit on the wall with the rest of the backlog and stuff like that. Uh, and I think the other part is they're, they're listing it in whatever electronic tools they're using now. They might be listing it in the items to say, hey, make sure this is done before we actually say that this is acceptable and then bring it to a sprint review for customers and stakeholders to, to see and give us their feedback. Yeah, yeah. The whole thing's gonna be a lot easier, right? What you said, Avi, is, is now that there are these commitments, it, what was definition of done before in Scrum? Yeah, it's in there. So it, was that an artifact? Well, sort of, kind of, almost. And in, in Sprint Goal, is that an artifact? Well, no, not really. Um, they were just sort of hanging out. <laughs> and um, and and we, we knew they were important. We put them in place. But for people learning this stuff, it's like, so what do we call this? You know, there's three artifacts, there's three roles, there's five events. What are those two things? And they just kind of exist. Um, now it's so clean, right? It's it's you, in your sprint backlog. There should be a sprinkle, and and part of your increment is the definition of done. That describes how an increment is born, right? Uh, how it how it becomes. One of my favorite lines in the Scrum Guide is the new one is uh, something along the lines of the moment a product backlog item meets the definition of done, an increment is born. You know, and, and that that sort of means so much. It could happen throughout the sprint. It's not something that we wait the end of the sprint for. Um, and then with the new product goal as well as part of the product backlog, these these things have a have a home now, and uh, that's what really excites me. It's going to make my life a lot easier. Yeah. Don, you, you, Don brought you brought up something really good, which is the whole thing that that notion of once the DOD is met, definition of done is met, the increment is born. I think one of the things this version of the guide helps can, can help people to see better is that uh, you don't just have to deliver once per sprint at the end at the sprint review. But rather, this fits a lot more in with uh, practices known as things like continuous integration and continuous deployment, which, by the way, don't just apply to software. You can deliver hardware or services or any other kind of product multiple times a sprint. It's not dictated only once at the end. And I think the wording in the previous Scrum Guide kind of made people feel that it was, whether or not that's true or not, but it made people feel that it was. But in this guide, we're really talking specifically about, hey, you know what? You don't, you, you can, you can keep, you can keep pumping it out. Yeah. One of the lines is as well. Um, don't let the sprint review be a gate to getting things in the hands of your customers or releasing or whatever they, whether they say for that. But yeah. Um, yeah, they're really, cause you're right. It's a, it's a, it's a horrible myth around scrum is that we got to wait till the end of the sprint. And that that's never been the case. It really, I think really good points, gentlemen, really good points. So um, we have a lot of you know people watching and listening to us right now. Some people are just getting started. Some people have been you know in the, doing this uh, agile industry for a long time. Just want to just clarify one question that's coming in. The product goal will be set by the product owner exclusively and or by the team. Let's kind of clear that up for some people who are might, might be new to this. So for the the product goal. Um, so I, I, I'm, I'm looking at how I've been using, I've been using something similar for, for a while with my teams. You know, I played the product owner role a lot. And um, I mean, I guess my, my accountability was that product backlog and the direction we were heading in. So I, I kind of like looked at it as my, I'm responsible for making sure there is a product goal and that it matters and we're moving towards it. 
But my responsibility was also to hear my team and, and get them bought in on this product goal. I want them to uh, be excited about this. I'm, I'm constantly looking for ways to, to explain the product goal in a way that makes clear who we're doing this for, whose lives are being improved by the work we're doing. And then I always had it as my mission to can I get my team to meet these people at least once a sprint, maybe more. And, and that was probably the single most important thing I could do to motivate the team is, is making that very, very clear. So a vision for sure, but then this goal, I think as Dave and JJ were talking about earlier, it's, it's gonna be a more measurable way of achieving that. And you could have multiple goals on your, on, on your way towards this aspire, aspirational vision, right? Um, so in that sense, I put it on the shoulders of the product owner a lot who, have, who has ultimate accountability of the product goal. Um, and, but that's me as somebody who's working out there as a product owner, um, I absolutely see it as my responsibility. You know, Don, you bring up really good points there. And, and Kevin, I think I think it's it's all in the wording, right? When we say who's supposed to make it, and Don brought in that word accountability, which right. as you know is a, a big change in the, in the in the Scrum Guide as we are now calling product owner Scrum Master and developer accountabilities. So when you ask who's accountable, it's product owner, right? They're accountable for making sure that product goals exist. But who makes them? Well, I think that really comes down to who is the product owner speaking to that wants this thing or these things that the team is gonna make. Product goals should be coming from conversation and collaboration with those who want them. Now, what Don brought in, which is interesting, is about, well, what about the team? And the answer is, well, that can happen too. For example, if someone came to us and said, well, my product goal is that pigs should fly, my team, when I bring it to them, might say, that's awesome, but I don't know if we can make that happen, right? So there's gotta be some kind of a, a reality make check. Make jump high. Yeah, right. Exactly. There's got to be some kind of a reality check that happens with the team, as, as Don says, by getting them to want to participate, not just buy in, but want to participate in making this thing and achieving these goals. But there's also got to be an understanding between the product owner and the customer or stakeholder that's asking for this thing. Hey, this is what we want. And it's all about, you know, if you really boil it down, Kevin, Scrum is all about having really good communication, really good lines of communication between those people who want the work done those people who interface with them, and then the folks, the, the awesome team of developers that are making this thing. If we can get those lines of communication open, transparent, and traveling, then we'll end up with really great product goals that are achievable in, in you know in time frames that are amenable to the team to actually being able to do it, you know, in real life. And it makes everything better. It it just makes work so much better when you do it that way. Yeah, that that word uh, accountable is really powerful. Um, I think that can resonate with, with everyone, you know, Don and Avi. And, you know, sometimes we will look and read words and say, well, I think that's this person's job or role. I think, you know, that doesn't belong on me, but it is a collective team from the product owner, the scrum master, and the team itself um, delivering that value, right, Don? So let, let's, I want to dig a little bit deeper on that since that is a new word or a different word that we put into the scrum guide. As we look at 25 years of celebrating scrum, Right. We have this new scrum guide that this, this just been released and we look at that word uh, accountability when we read the guide with all these folks in the industry and in these teams, they read the guide. You know, how would we suggest that they look at that and incorporate some of these new terms into what they're doing and their work on the ground every day? Yeah, so um, it, it's a discussion that people get into all the time over beers, <laughs> accountability versus responsibility. Um, I guess the way I look at it and the scrum guide seems to align with this is um, accountability is ultimately it's, it's on, it's on me, right? If I'm accountable, this is, this, it's on me. Now, if I have worked with a lot of people I trust, I can assign responsibility. They can be responsible. They care for this. They're going to do it, but you know, it's, it's really about me. So there's a few, now we've kind of made it pretty clear in the scrum guide. Now, the latest one is the product owner is accountable for the product backlog. Now, does that mean they have to write up all the PBIs and acceptance criteria? No, absolutely not. They work with people they trust. They can delegate a lot of the responsibility, um, but they're accountable. And the scrum master is accountable for scrum. If scrum's not happening um, or, or we're not following the things we said we were going to follow as a team, like even the process that we all came to agree to, with, that we all agreed to, this, the scrum master is accountable for that. Um, now they're not doing the work, but they're accountable for the success of Scrum in that sense. So we, tr 
uh, in this scrum guide, it seems to be very, very clear that there's a separation there. They've used the word responsibility and they use the, the word accountability uh, very, very clearly, where I think before it was kind of all over the place with it. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, absolutely. There's one question, there's one, one person out here who's saying, you know, absolutely likes the idea of introducing a product goal, right? It's just that they're still struggling a bit uh, as it sounds somehow determined. And they say that they can fulfill or abandon, you know, abandon um, an objective. My thinking is I can also adjust it. How would you respond to that, Avi? Yeah, so uh, listen, in Scrum, it's, it's interesting, you know, nothing's really written in stone. As you can see with the Scrum Guide, we, we've got so many iterations since it first came out. We're always amenable to changing the guide. And the same thing has to be for our own product goal. We've got to be open to learning from experience. The, the root of why Scrum works is it's embracing the notion of empiricism or empirical process design, which is that we're going to take what we learn in the field and then adapt, inspect and adapt and apply it to whatever it is we're doing next. So my answer to that is you have to be open to being able to change it, but you couldn't just start, you couldn't just start scrumming on something without having a product goal because then, well, which way are we actually going? You got to at least say, Hey, listen, let's go this way. If we're, we, we know that we've got to be open to changing direction and pivoting, this is a common phrase we hear in the land of Agile. If evidence shows us that we're going in the wrong direction, but we still have to pick a place to start. We still have to pick a direction to start. Uh, Avi, are you saying that we should have some kind of a North Star when we set ready to go? We should have something that we're, that we're gravitating towards? Absolutely. This is what product goal, product vision, this is what these things are about. But we've always yeah. got to go into changing. I, I beg to differ a little bit in terms of like, there's lots of teams that start without that. Um, what, what they end up doing, and maybe a lot of people see this out there, and maybe it's in their own scrum practices, is we just look at whatever the customer is complaining about the most, right? What's in our email inbox? And it's just this random smattering of stuff, and there's no clear sprint goal, and not, never mind a product goal. Um, there's always stuff to do. And they, they enter sprint planning going, okay, what's the latest complaints? Let's put them in there. I'll take this, you do that. And, and then away they go. And they're just kind of wandering around aimlessly. Um, the product, it, so it's starting Scrum right, the product goal is essential, yes. Yeah. Check, check, check out this comment that I'm reading live right now from our questions. From a quick yeah. initial scan, I really like the new Scrum guide. Need to go over a little more, obviously, but it appears to have a lot of clarity and a more forthright in the older version Congratulations, folks. Now, this is some this hot news that's coming in right as, as we're speaking today. So the guide is resonating with folks, Avi and, and Dad. There are some things in there, some, some new words. And we, we often hear, right, Dad, Avi, that words are really powerful. Something's written in stone. We, we're reading it on the paper. But I, I think we're also saying, too, we have to be able to inspect and adapt and, and use the guide that's going to really be, be best for us. Yeah, I think, the, I think the right words might be, it's written in stone for now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we, we, had, we had, as Don mentioned, we had three questions that we said you had to answer at the, daily, at the Daily Scrum. That was written in stone for then. Now that seems to dis have disappeared. Uh, another great example of a change inside the new Scrum Guide, for example, is the topics in sprint planning, right? We've now, we now have three instead of two. So we're, and again, as Don mentioned before, it's, it's not that in great scrum teams, they weren't answering all three. It's just that that wasn't listed in the guide. So now we're talking about the why, the what, and the how. And it doesn't mean that the why was missing before. Many teams were always talking about the why. And that's, our, that's one of these big phrases, right? You hear in Agile all the time, right? Start with why, start with why. And now we're just reminding everybody that that's the best way to start that we know at this time because it helps to get everybody on the same page as well as get everybody motivated when you know when a scrum team knows why it's doing what it's doing it tends to be able to do it with much more gusto which much more zest of, yes that's we want to help achieve that and i think that that's another great change in this edition of the guide awesome don no i mean i i totally agree um the the um the other big one is is the whole i think probably the most controversial probably the one people are going to have the uh, hardest time with is de there's no more development team i i guess um and now it's developers and and the the thinking behind that is is we're trying to what we see all the time out there is this sort of this anti-pattern where 
um, you know, stuff comes to the product owner and the dev team sits and waits for the product owner to do just amount of work, right amount of work. And if it doesn't meet a certain definition, they throw it back at them. And um, they're focused more on, okay, what does the product, your, it's your call product owner, whatever you want product owner. Um, and, and it was kind of an us and them, not that it was ever meant to be that way, but that's how so many scrum implementations went. It was a sort of a hierarchy that ended up happening or even worse, the development team had to speak to the scrum master who spoke to the product owner, who was likely a proxy to speak to somebody else. So a change this time around was to help kind of solve that, which is we're just one team. There's no team within a team. We're just one group of, of, of people that are passionate about this product and trying to achieve the product goal. We're all in it together. Any one of us could talk to a customer. Like how do we get to that situation where we're trusted enough to just go talk to the customer? Um, we're all thinking new, new ways, new things, new opportunities, ways of pivoting. We're all in it together. That's going to be tough. Um, it, it's just kind of one group of people um, all focused the same way. You know, I think it's interesting, Don. I, I, and it, it's interesting because, and I think it wasn't necessarily not a problem before. I think we've seen that problem for a long time that uh, people were confused about whether or not a product owner or scrum master that these were titles or roles. And we had spent a lot of time in iterations of the scrum guide. And I know you and I both train quite often, a lot of, a lot of folks, and they have a tough, under, under, a tough time understanding what's the difference between a title versus a role. And now the word role is gone and we've gone to accountability. And this, of course, now, as you said, now eliminates the, the dichotomy of two teams, a team within a team. It's one team and people on that team have accountabilities. I think the least often or most missed line in the whole scrum guide is that it says the product owner, you know, is, is accountable for these things or may, or, and may do them or may delegate it to someone else. And this is an, an important understanding is that product management no longer belongs to individuals, the product, you know, the project manager or this or the product. It's, it's, a, it's a collective ownership. The team owns this and the product owner fulfills these accountabilities and may delegate some of that work to someone else on the team. And I think that that's a really important distinction. Now, I think that that might make it tough for folks in traditional business who are looking for, well, what do I put on my business card now? Uh, account, I, I'm an accountability. I, I don't know exactly how I'm supposed to term that. That's something yeah. I think we're going to face as we go through, inspect and adapt and help people decide or understand that just as it was a role before, it's still, it, it's now a set of accountabilities. These are your obligations to the team in order to fulfill the team's obligation to our customers and stakeholders that want great stuff from us. You, you got me thinking that it's, it's just, it's another example of being less prescriptive, right? Scrum doesn't tell you what the titles are in your organization or the roles even right so it's it's these are some accountabilities who makes the most sense within your team your organization to take on those accountabilities um so it w now works with without having to change all of those things it's these are accountabilities who's taking them on um i think that again it's less prescriptive because of it yeah, you don't have somebody with a scrum master title oh you can't do scrum Right. Well, the, the, the scrum guide is not saying that you have to call the people on the team developers that they now have to have business cards, right? If you're doing scrum and marketing, nobody's yeah. expecting marketing people to suddenly have a business card that says marketing developer. That's, that's not what they're going to have. And that's totally okay. We're saying that there is, there is a set of accountabilities for those folks that are developing these amazing solutions that we see in the market all the time. It's an accountability. It's not a title. It's what yeah. you do. It's not who you are. Right. You know, it's interesting, Ivy, that you say developing whatever it is. It could be a process. It could be a product, right? Whatever we're developing. And the question that's coming in right now, which is really interesting, kind of a, a different slant, and I want you to respond to this. You know, does the removal of the development team strip protection from them and encourage the people to step over their boundaries? Really interesting question of how, how they phrase that. I mean, you know, we're also kind of talking about the scrum master role in terms of, you know, protecting the team, but we're not saying roles, we're saying more accountable now. How would you respond to that, that question that's coming in the feed? You know, for me, I would say it, it actually makes it more, it, it makes it more level, right? We're, we're, we're as Don said, it's not, it's not creating a hierarchy or creating a, a chain of command and, and a communication pattern or flow that has to be followed. It's actually making it more open. It's making it more collaborative. It's making it more group owned and unified. So I would, I would actually say, no, I don't, I don't, I don't think that's going to happen. I certainly hope that that doesn't happen. 
And I, know and that I think that the, the team, <laughs> sorry, Abby. Um, I think the teams that take that stance that we have protection in scrum, I think there's deeper underlying issues there anyways that we've got to fix. So I think what this will do is make it even more transparent. So, I mean, what are they worried now, now that they are, you know, there's one team, one scrum team that this one person with the accountabilities of product owner will, will bully them into doing things they don't want to do. I think that will become more obvious and they have to work it out. Just like if there's one person on the old, the old version of the guy, the dev team, that's, that's senior and bullying people one way or the other, or making people do other things, you know, they got to figure this out, their team of adults um, and, and, and let them work on it. Right. So we want to just bring them together as, and, and respect them as a team and, and they'll work through these things. Uh, that's, that's the way these healthy teams will operate. Yeah. So it seems like gentlemen, you know, the, the, the mindset of really having that team approach having that team energy, developing that team culture is going to be really essential to really drive this accountability where at home in terms of the, the new scrum guide, right? Yeah, and I, I love, uh, and it's not like it wasn't in the last guide, but I love how we're really enforcing and, and really, you know, talking about the values so much because that is where the, that is the root of the culture, right? Is the culture is really the sum total of all the actions of the team, but what underlies those actions? And it's gotta be the scrum values. And we really have to, and I know I know Don and myself and, and Kevin, I know you too, because we work together. I know everybody out there who's been on this call, we're, we're all pushing the scrum values as much as we possibly can, especially in companies where it seems like their actions tend to be contrary to that. And so I hope the guide, I hope those that read it can really try to use this as a way to shine a light on the fact that if you want your scrum to function optimally, you've really gotta live by these values, you got to make them come to life. It's really, really essential. Does it mean you can do Scrum without it? I mean, we've all worked in companies, Don, I'm sure you have too, where a lot of these values were stepped on day, day in and day out. But how good did the Scrum work? Probably not so well. Whereas when we, when we can really get a group of individuals and even larger groups of individuals to embrace these values, to work their teams through them, to really make them come to life, the, the, the potential of what the Scrum team can do becomes unlimited. Yeah. Now we have about 12 minutes left in our segments. We're going to end this at 12.15 Eastern. If we kind of juxtapose the, the previous Scrum Guide that was released in 2017, what we just re-released today, and just, just follow me here. So if we were to merge those together, what kind of falls out and what should we really be kind of like holding to our hearts and, and really pushing this forward as we continue our transformations and new teams that we're standing up and companies, people who are really veterans in this, what, what are some of the key things that we can pull away and, and pull us forward in, 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 our, in our organizations? Um, I, I mean, I guess I, the first thing I always go to is how it is, it is more inviting. Um, I, I work like probably the top, our top clients that are going through agile adoptions right now, um, they're, the top three are not software for the most part, right? There might be a few here and there. Um, but they're, they're in all sorts of industries, uh, procurement to pharmaceuticals to, you know, working on oil rigs, right? That kind of stuff. And when we'd work with them and then point them towards the scrum guide, they'd say things like, well, you know, it doesn't feel like it's quite for us. And then I, my, my response is, what do you mean? The word software doesn't show up in it at all. You, you know, search for it. But it did have words like, you know, system and uh, testers and, things that were kind of conducive to that, or even the word release, um, it, it just, it doesn't fit right there, right? So, and, and now it's it's working, it, it can work for anybody reading this. We've, we've seen it, we, it's, it's proven that this is well beyond the IT industry, certainly software, um, and a lot of people are getting value from it. So I, that's what I'm excited about. And I think that's the way I'm going to tout it, I suppose. If, if, if I asked by my customers, why should we go to the next Scrum Guide? Or, well, there's, a, you know, that marketing team that you're trying to get stuff from and they're running into issues that are feeding you things. Well, maybe you can, they can apply this stuff too. Or that operations group or, or the, the auditors that are doing all the compliance stuff, like maybe they can get value out of this as well. Um, we're all trying to do these complex things. Um, now it's more accessible. Mm -hmm. I agree with Don totally. I think uh, one of the most important things that I would distill out of it, as you said, Kevin, is the, the notion of increments, the notion of delivering incrementally and iteratively. 
it doesn't matter what it is you're making. It doesn't matter if it's a product, a service. It doesn't matter if it's a project. It doesn't matter if it's hardware or software. It doesn't matter if it's operations procedures or, or human resource procedures, people operations, as we, we tend to call it. What matters is that you're, you're putting something out that you can show folks, get feedback and inspect and adapt for the future. Because the, the most of the dissatisfaction that we see, which is why a lot of people switch from traditional project management to running things, in an agile way with Scrum. The point of it was that when they would get the thing out at the end, they were dissatisfied. So for me, I would always keep holding on to the fact that this guide still enforces, both of them still enforce this notion of, we need to deliver incrementally and iteratively in order to really delight our customers, not just answer some, some set of, uh, a big set of document requirements that we were handed on day one. And here we are 180 days later and so much has changed and we didn't take any account for that. We wanna be able to show our customers constantly that we're outcome driven and part of understanding what your outcomes are is that your outcomes may change during the course of development and we're gonna welcome those changes and we're gonna accommodate for those. You know, I've really make an interesting point what makes me think about, hey, you know, the first Scrum Guide, what, over a hundred pages? Now here we are in 2020 is 13 pages. So what's happened in industry and business, you know, across the planet, everybody's getting better, right? We're delivering more, we're doing incrementally. And, and Don, you said the word, you know, more inviting. And Ivy, you used the word more welcoming. As we think about organizations and teams that do it from the grassroots level or people who do it more formally, right? Or that one single person in the organization is like, you know what? I read the guide, you know, I, 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 I'm gonna really try to do this thing on my own or, or is leadership gonna, you know, take the reins and, and do that. What I just said from grassroots, formal, single person doing it, leadership, and we think about being accountable and delivering incrementally and being welcoming what would you say in the last few few minutes to all the people who are watching us and who will probably watch this recording later, the best way to approach that? Well, um, I, I think we hit on a lot of those. There's, there's something, I guess, more specific that's worth addressing. I, I think that can hit on that is, is um, the term developers, you know, that, that's a tough one sometimes and they may not see that as welcoming. Um, so I think the way we look at that word, because I've had to wrestle with that myself. Um, interestingly, I was I was part of a a group a while back that that dealt with this problem, which was, hey, we've got we've got development team. We want them to be one team, not a team within a team. But what would we call? Them? We got the Scrum Master accountabilities. We've got the product owner, and then what about everybody else? What do we call? Them? And try this exercise for anyone listening, go through it, grab a group of friends, grab some beers <laughs> and go through it. What would you call them? They, these are people that are cross industry, um, focused on quality, building something of value, um, at least once a sprint, hopefully more. What would we call them? And we went through lots of words. I, I don't even want to go over them all right now. I don't want to cr create any kind of <laughs> conflict or they, that, that word would have been a lot better, but try it. I mean, and there's, there was issues with each of them. The only ones I find, the only industries that have a problem with the word developer is, interestingly enough, the uh, IT one. I heard this from Dave West, actually, is, is, and it's true. I've tried that with a lot of them. When you're, when you're in a marketing group, developer could mean, you know, we're developing marketing material. Um, if I work in a pharmaceutical company, developing means something different. Um, then it's not doesn't necessarily mean programmer. So it is using the word developer actually helps this guide be more welcoming, more open to lots of different industries. It's just us in IT that have to get over the fact that when we say the word developer, we don't just mean programmers. It's it's um, anyone that's focused on developing a valuable increment. Mm. I think part of the guide that's uh, welcoming, so to speak, is just the framework itself. And, you know, KB, we go through a lot of implementations where people are like almost afraid to adopt Scrum. They're afraid that if, if we take this class and we're doing it all week and this and that, that on Monday, everything changes. Like if you're working, for example, with a, a consumer packaged goods company, like I do that, for some bizarre reason on Monday, we're not gonna be making uh, uh, awesome beer or fantastic desserts that we that we sell around the world and we're not going to still make tons of money and have great valuable outcomes for our customers. No, you're, you're still going to do that on Monday. It's still going to happen. Everything's still going to be okay. The difference is how we go about it, 
right? The beauty of the Scrum framework is that we formalize all of these processes around creating goals and planning and checking in and having our sprint review and our retrospective. We formalize all of this so we can operationalize the learning that we get. And I think if we explain it that way, for those of us that are out there teaching this stuff day to day, for those of you out there that are living this stuff day to day, if you can explain it that way, you are calling everybody in because everyone's doing all these things anyway, but they don't necessarily do it in a way that lets them constantly improve, right? We always remember where did all of this stuff start from? Where did all we learn? Con continuous improvement is, is at the heart of Scrum. And if we remember that and remind ourselves of that, that's a way to call everybody in because nobody wants to keep going and not doing well or not getting better. That's not why people go to work. They don't go to work to fail on purpose or to never improve. They were, all of us are going to work to make better things, to make people's lives better, whether it's working in healthcare like, like we've done or whether, it's, or whether it's making great products that we sell in the, in, the, in the market. So if we remember that that's the heart of this, that will help call everybody in, that this is about continually improving inspecting and adapting what it is we do every single day. And then gentlemen, are you saying that this definitive guide to Scrum, the rules of the game that just got released, what everybody's reading right now and listening to us speak on this, this wonderful webinar is really a good way to implement some of those uh, accountabilities and, and be more welcome and inviting as we go on the ground to deliver really good stuff for the world. Is that what you're saying, Avi and Don? <laughs> Absolutely. It's a, good, it's a good place to start, right? Um, what are what are the requirements? We always we always give a prereq for our classes is read read the scrum guide, read it, read it, and they're gonna read it. But you know, it's gonna take. I I've I've read this thing, different versions of it, uh, I don't, countless times, and every time I read it, it's something else, right? And you get with a bunch of other scrum nerds like me and and we 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 pour over it like it's the constitution right what did they mean by this word and it's just at the end of the day it's just a document um and, and it's a better document now and I, I i think it's good but scrum isn't the goal um the goal is the values or building awesome products and, and improving people's lives that's the goal these are a, a bunch of things we can do to get better at that and and my company we've We've been building products for a long time and we've tried a lot of different things and the bet we keep coming back to scrum it's the thing that's worked best for us if it's something better came along no offense ken and jeff we'd probably jump ship we're, we're here to build value for our customers and um scrum is the best way we've found to do that and, and this guide is just start i mean it, don't forget about the values like avi mentioned um i would take a team not doing scrum but folk that that have the that instilled those five values over team doing scrum that had not it's these are tools that can help us in, get to those values and and that's what's the key thing to me it's just a document yep 12 14 one minute left super closing remarks avi and down avi i just want to say thank you to ken and to jeff for giving us this document back in the day and also for the iterations that have come since then I know that Scrum has made a huge difference in my life in the life of those that I work with and in so many people that I meet tangentially to this. And it's just, it's amazing to just see the impact that this has had over the last 25 years. So to both of you, thank you so much and happy birthday to Scrum. Absolutely. Yes, happy birthday Scrum. And, uh, uh, and I, I really appreciate being a part of it. So I've got a huge passion for Scrum. I, I, I first encountered it in 2003 and I never looked back. I was a contributing member of a team. I'm like, I want to keep doing this. And whether they asked me to or not, I, I did it. Uh, we called it covert Scrum back then. And, and uh, now, now you're seeing it's a huge, it's very much different. It's not just a team or a little department. It's whole organizations get this and are, and are bringing this on. So happy birthday, Scrum. Um, here's to another 25 years. Absolutely. Don, Avi, thank you so much. Ditto on everything you said today. All the folks who are your, bringing in your questions and your comments, we thank you so much. Uh, Ken Schwaber, Jeff, Dr. Jeff Sutherland, thank you so much. That ends our segment for today. Thank you, gentlemen. Thanks, guys. Thanks, everybody. Throughout this program, we've been sharing some of our favorite Scrum stories from the Scrum and Agile community. But what about Jeff's or Ken's? Yep, we asked them too. And here is what they had to say.
You know, I remember we were sitting in Lexington in the Pete's Coffee Shop. We're sitting outside the bench. And you said to me, you know, how come people don't really understand we're on a mission? We've been on a mission to change the world, but uh, I've always felt we're kind of like the Blues Brothers, you know. <laughs> you never yep. know what you're going to run into. <laughs> some of it is some of it is not pretty. <laughs> Feels like the Blues Brothers. Um, I, I'm I'm just very pleased that we got it, but it is it has been a mission otherwise. I don't think we or a lot of the people that joined us as we um, met and shared this would have kept going. Yeah. The, the big thing it did is people went home, um, if they went home, um, after having worked on a scrum team and they felt satisfied and they felt empowered. They didn't mm -hmm. feel beaten on it. They didn't feel like um, life and work was a terrible thing. Um, and I, I do hope, I haven't seen that spread as much, particularly I'm looking toward Washington, D.C., but I haven't seen that spread as much as I was hoping. But it is spreading. Life is fun. The thing that's meant the most to me is that people have taken it and somehow <clears throat> they've taken a, a little bit of inspiration that we've given them and they come back and they say, you know, Scrum has changed my life. And they have a real sense of gratitude that things are better for them, for their family, for their work, for their business. Uh, it's very satisfying. The, the, the thing I've had to hold back on is to remember they changed their lives. Yeah, absolutely. All, all, all we did was kind of like whisper in their ear and off they went. Yeah. Thanks to everyone who shared their Scrum stories. You can still share yours. Just use the hashtag Scrum25 in your post. Time now for our final session, questions, answers, and closing thoughts with Dr. Jeff Sutherland. Thanks, Tom, for setting this up. Uh, we really appreciate the help from all the people that have worked on this guide. This has taken over a year. A year ago, we wanted to make the guide less prescriptive for everyone, not just software developers, still based on all the empirical evidence and the empirical way of working in Scrum. But the first iteration of that, a lot of people didn't like. We had to go back to the drawing board. Then many months later, we came out with another iteration and, and there, there were still people that didn't like that one. So we had to go back to the drawing board again and involve many different players in many different organizations until we could get to one scrum guide that everybody could generally agree, this is, this is the best we can get right now. And it's lighter, <laughs> uh, it's easier to read, uh, it's more concise and it's actually more tightly coupled. Uh, so, you know, our hope it is actually clear. And I feel much more comfortable in handing, the, handing this to a sales team now uh, than the more software oriented guy that we had in the past. So our hope as always is that this will enable people to really have a much better way of working uh, and, and build much more successful companies. And in, in this COVID time, the ability to work remotely and be agile has separated the pack. We have companies whose stock has exploded in COVID because, because of their mostly, agile is mostly scrum because of their scrum and their agility uh, they move quickly way ahead of the pack where thousands of less agile companies are going bankrupt and continue to go bankrupt. So that, that makes all of you doing Scrum critical to the survival of your organizations. You know, last year it used to be nice to be agile. This year, it and your company depends on you to stay alive. So 
it's a big responsibility. And I, I think uh, with this guide, it's gonna give us some leverage to step up to it even more quickly by having it more simple and easy to understand. I know there's probably a thousand questions. Uh, uh, Zoom doesn't even tell me the number. It's, all, <laughs> it's more than a hundred out there. We know that. Uh, and Tom I, is, has sorted through them and kind of popped the, the most often asked ones to the top, right? So Tom, you're gonna help us <laughs> with those questions. <laughs> I'll be happy to, Jeff. And I just wanna say, first of all, congratulations to you and Ken for the 25th anniversary of Scrum. I'm sure I speak for everybody here in the audience when I say that the world is a better place for what the two of you created and have rolled out to the world. So I do wanna say thank you for that. And uh, you're not far off, actually. If you go through, we're, we're nearing a thousand questions, which is pretty good. So I am going to try to couple these together. I'll be summarizing and looking for big themes. So I apologize if I don't get the questions exactly as you worded them. But we're trying, you know, in the interest of efficiency, we're trying to make sure that we can address the questions more broadly. Um, so Jeff, there's been a number of questions about the Scrum Master. I'm going to start with this one. Um, the new Scrum Guide says the Scrum Master is accountable for the Scrum team's effectiveness. In what ways do you see the Scrum Master doing this differently than in the past? Well, I think the, the intent is the same as the past. But as we were beginning to put this guide together, uh, Ken said to me, I think the biggest problem in Scrum is the word servant leadership. And I said, why? He said, because many people have interpreted that as they don't need to enable the team to improve and they're not responsible for that improvement. And we have many management teams saying, you know, we're paying these scrum masters a lot of money, but they're just secretaries. Why should we, why should we pay them? And so we said, we got to do something about that because the scrum master's livelihood depend on them being, being you know, really valuable contributors to the, to the community. And how could we fix that? So initially, Ken says, let's just take servant leadership out of the guide. And then <laughs> many of the coaches actually that are in this, <laughs> in this conference today said, no, 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 we can't do that. <laughs> So then we, we, we thought about it. We said, okay, you know, really the problem is that the scrum master is not doing the leadership part of servant leadership. So, so let's just reverse the words. It's still the same thing, but the leadership is front and center. So it, it's something that has always been important, but uh, as always, when we upgrade the guide, a little shift in emphasis gets people more focused on the most important thing. So scrum masters are now leaders who serve instead of servant leaders. And some people will wonder if that is indeed more than just a reordering of those specific words. And in prior conversations that you and I have had, there is a bit more to it than just a reordering. What is the difference between a leader who serves and a servant leader? Well, you know, I always go back to the models that I have in my mind when we created Scrum. One of them is what Taichi Ono did on the Toyota production line. He said, we're going to eliminate the manager or the foreman that General Motors has, and we're going to put a facilitative leader in charge. And that facilitative leader will know every job on the line and we'll be able to train every person on that team. And then we'll actually help them do the work. Okay, so, so that's one time, type of leader who serves. Another model has, uh, has been, you know, the, the, the great scrum teams in, in rugby <laughs> uh, were, were always a, a, a inspiration, particularly to the early teams in scrum. And the, the captains of those rugby teams were legendary. I mean, uh, you can see that in the movie Invictus when the, when the South African team beat the All Blacks, uh, you know, the president of uh, South Africa called the captain of the rugby team <laughs> to the mansion and said, I want you to win against the All Blacks. And the whole story that unfolds then, 
how that team captain figured out how to beat the All Blacks, that's what a great scrum master is, okay? So that's quite different than just taking notes at the daily meeting, right? <laughs> so we want to inject that, you know, that feeling, a sense of mission that, you know, not that you're going to tell people what to do, but you're going to talk to the people and explain the importance of what we're doing, create inspiration for the people. And then you're, you're going to get out there and take blows for your team. That's what a great team captain does, right? They're on the field playing alongside and they're often the first people to get hit really hard. Okay. And because of that, people follow them. And that's the reason the South African team won against the All Blacks. So we, we would like to see many, many, many great teams like that. Uh, and we have in the world of Scrum, we've seen some amazing teams that have exceeded, far exceeded any expectation. Teams that have done what I thought was impossible. Hmm. Another aspect of this, Jeff, um, sticking with Scrum Masters, and leaders who serve is that the scrum master is not just focused on team in this new updated 2020 scrum guide. There is more of a focus on helping and coaching the organization as a whole. Can you walk us through that? Yes. And this is because from the very beginning, if you go back to the work of uh, Professor Takeuchi and Tanaka, even, even today, Takeuchi and Tanaka are, are mentors and we're constantly talking to them. Uh, and Anaka has always said that 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 frontline person is a catalyst for organizational change, and to be the catalyst for that change, they 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 manage down and they manage up is the way that he would frame it. So if you're going to do an Anaka Scrum, which is you know the Scrum that I've always tried to teach, then the Scrum Master has to you know, deal with the management as well as facilitate the team. That They both go together. Mm -hmm. um, so that's a big job and a lot of new scrum masters, you know, they have to have, have a lot of learning <laughs> and coaching before they can actually do it well. But if they set that as a, as a goal uh, to move towards, we'll have much better scrub and much better scrum masters. Okay, I'm gonna move on to another question. And I quote, I have seen some people interpret the guide in a wrong way, and they have the product owner and scrum master as the same person. And they ask us to clarify, but I'm going to put a little twist on this, um, on this question in particular, because clarifying the scrum guide, getting rid of misconceptions has been a major focus of yours and Ken's in this new updated 2020 scrum guide, correct? Yeah, on that particular issue that you brought up, and Earlier, some earlier scrum guys, we said the product owner and the scrum master couldn't be the same person. But um, certainly in 2017, maybe the guy before that, we removed that restriction. We're still pointing out that that's, that could be a problem. The product owners and the scrum masters had different agendas. But we took it out because we saw on some small high technology team, you had a leader who was like a chief engineer at Toyota, who was, who, who really understood both the technology um, and the strategy and for a small team was able to manage, manage those roles. Um, and, and we still don't recommend it. <laughs> I mean, even a two, a two person scrum team that I coached that went public and retired in two years, <laughs> I said, one of you guys needs to be the scrum master one of you guys be the product owner, even though you're both coding like crazy, because if one of you isn't worried about making some money, you're gonna run out of money. <laughs> and if one of you isn't worried about fixing what's broken, committees don't fix things well, right? <laughs> so that's what they did. And that I think was one of the keys to success. So another big theme that we saw were questions about changes in the daily scrum. In particular, the three questions, you know, we had the, the classic three questions that we all probably can recite by heart. Why did those go? What's the thinking? 
Well, in 2017, we, we made the questions optional. And the reason for that, we saw teams using other uh, techniques that were, were, were quite effective. And we also saw a lot of misuse of the questions. You know, the, for some teams, it was just a status report. You know, I worked on this yesterday, I'll be working on this today, and I'll, I have no impediments. And, and there's no cross collaboration. One of the best daily meetings uh, I've seen, we published in a paper called Shock Therapy. And uh, Scott Downey who was a great coach. And he decided that there was, it, 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 there was only gonna be one question in the daily meeting is, that was, why isn't the first story done? And how do we get the maximum number of people on this team getting that one story done now? As soon as that question was answered, the daily meeting was over. He got everybody going twice, every single team, 100%. Double productivity within one or two sprints and we're going five times as fast within six sprints. 100% hmm. of teams going five times as fast by actually asking one question in the daily meeting. <laughs> and it's because it generates the pattern that we call swarming, okay? It generates the dynamic that, that needs to come out of that daily meeting to really make, to get powerful results for the team. So this less, less prescriptive approach is actually created to allow or implemented rather to allow for more flexibility for teams to be able to adjust and adapt in ways that they need. Right. And also it gives the scrum master more, more focus on the scrum master needs to provide leadership <laughs> and creativity on how to set up that daily meeting. He's not just following a, a rules list, right? <laughs> sure. So another big bucket of questions that we saw, and I wanna thank our earlier panelists for addressing many of these, but I still think it's, it's worth a, a bit of a conversation about. Are these new commitments? Each of the three Scrum artifacts now has a corresponding commitment. Walk us through the commitments for each artifact and why they're there, how they help. Okay, so the, the, the sprint goal has already been there, always been there. And uh, an example of why that's needed, I was in Silicon Valley working with a hardware software company building mobile devices and uh, multiple teams building this new operating system for this new device and doing really well, uh, going really fast. And uh, I, I was in Palo Alto and they called me up one day, I was working someplace else. They said, Jeff, the productivity of all teams was cut in half last spread. Come on over. So, so I go over there and I get together with the product owners, the scrum masters and the management. And I ask them, well, do you, want, do you know why that happened? And everybody said, no. So I said, okay, let's go out and we'll interview, everybody go out and interview one or two developers and then we'll come back in an hour and figure it out. Well, when we came back, they said the backlog was not clear to the developers. It was just a bunch of tasks. They had no goal. And so it's summertime and the surf is up. They're all leaving early to go surfing. And I thought, you know, these developers, they're really smart developers <laughs> in these companies. And they're like racehorses, you know, if the gate opens and there's not another racehorse running, the racehorse doesn't run. And I said, this is really a really bad problem because the best developers are the ones that will not run if there's no goal. <laughs> so we absolutely have a goal. So what we did is we fixed the backlog and we said the goal of the next spread is to make this mobile device run 10% faster. We have a performance problem. So everything in there, a lot of different things, is all to try to push speed. Boom, the productivity of every team doubled immediately in the very next sprint. So once that became really clear to me, like we had to have a sprint goal <laughs> in the scrum guide. So it's, it's just as important today as then. Uh, and we also really wanted commitment to that goal. You know, we de-emphasized commitment to 
getting 59 points in the spread because the managers were weaponizing the, the velocity data. You know, if you got 58 points that were beating the teams up, you didn't meet your 59 points. So we, we, we got that out of there. Okay, it's a forecast. What we want the team to do is to commit to the goal, but it wasn't as clear in the last guide as it is in this one. So that's the sprint goal. The product goal, we got complaints and uh, it was picked, particularly one of the German trainers who may be on, the, uh, on this call said, you know, the product owners we have in Germany, the biggest problem is they have, they have no vision of where, they, where they're going. And even though the word vision was in the guide, uh, it's a big problem. So I talked to Ken about it and his feeling was, you know, we need to make it concrete. Uh, how do you translate that into a practical reality? And he said, okay, we have a product backlog. It's obviously designed for, to achieve a larger business objective, but that product backlog has a goal. And the team needs to be working towards that goal, even though sprint to sprint, they have smaller sprints goals, they need add, to add up to the total goal. And if they don't understand that, that direction, they don't work as well and they don't deliver as good a product. So we've elevated the goal to a major um, thing in the guide. And we said the product backlog itself is related to a goal and the team is to is, is achieving that goal. That's their commitment. Now, another story about this that's really important. I was in a venture capital group. I, I work with venture capitalists a lot, investing in scrum companies. Uh, and we had a panel in Boston. We asked them, do you invest in lean startups? And every single VC said no. And people were stunned why not? And they said, because we invest in really smart people that are fanatic about achieving a goal and they will work on it for years without deviating. And the only reason they pivot, which is a useful concept in Lean Startup, is it's like trying to cross the ocean and the wind is coming in a different direction. So they will they will tack, but they're, they're fanatically focused on a target. And they said, that's where we make all our money. So we don't invest in anything else. So that again told me the VCs have figured out the product goal is the most important thing. Everything else is secondary. Um, Done again is something we've always had in there. <laughs> and uh, it's always That's been a definition huge, of done to be clear. <laughs> definition yeah. of done is always been a, a huge issue in the scrum guide and every single guide. And so, uh, but, and the increment has is, is been important too, but it really hasn't enough, it hasn't had enough focus because we find, you know, the industry data shows 58% of scrum teams can't deliver an increment. They're late or they're over budget. Customers unhappy. So this is probably, in my view, the lead, the biggest problem in the industry is that people can't deliver. And so I think by saying, okay, the definition of done, the commitment that is tied to that increment is that is the definition of done, and that increment is done, uh, gives that issue more force. Uh, than it had before. So I think tying these things together gives more push in the right direction uh, in people's mind, which is always the goal of the Scrum Guide. And, it, and every Scrum Guide kind of tries to correct a little bit the misperceptions. You know, everybody's going off in this other direction. <laughs> oh, servant leadership means, you know, I just take notes at the daily meeting. I'm not supposed to I'm not supposed to tell anybody anything. <laughs> no. <laughs> Leader who serves <laughs> means the daily meeting, those people are coming out of their 
they're swarming to get stuff done. And it's your job as a scrum master to figure out how to make that happen. So another thing that we're seeing in the uh, questions that still keep popping in is a number of people who have noted that Scrum teams are now self-managing when they, in the last iteration of the Scrum Guide, were self-organizing. And I know this is particularly important to you, Jeff. Walk us through what that means. Okay, so this is probably the third biggest problem in not just at Scrum, in any Agile practice anywhere. Because you go into, I ask people every time I'm in front of a group, I say, okay, raise your hand if you have an Agile developer in your organization that thinks Agile means they just do whatever they want. 100% of the hands go up. So that means these people, these people have taken self-organization and they've weaponized it to serve their own personal interest at the expense of destroying the product. I mean, that's, it's a serious, serious problem. Mm. So the, the, the reason that self-organization is in there is that it comes out of complex adaptive systems theory where an intelligent system, when it runs into a problem, it self-organizes to achieve a goal, right? So now we've got the goals front and center and so what do we do with self-organization? Well, we, we said, okay, you're gonna self-manage to achieve the goal. That's what self-organization is in a complex adaptive systems theory. The system is self-managing to achieve a goal. So we're hoping that's going to solve the problem of, uh, you know, let's, let's look at ex an example that, you know, it's publicly, a uh, very large company, stock price, you know, went like from 50 to five. In that company, we had audited a thousand developers. We had, we found out 300 of them were agile developers doing whatever they want. Within six months, they had to lay off 400 people and the stock goes from 50 to five. Okay, so, so this is not just a minor problem, okay? This is people's jobs are at stake, uh, companies are, are at stake, particularly now in COVID, people really need to work together to help make their organization successful so that they continue to have a job and can feed their family. Because right now there are a lot of people that have no job. And uh, so if we can build better companies Scrum is a fantastic tool for that. We'll have more things for people to do that can benefit their families. So I want to move in. We've got about four minutes left, Jeff. I'm going to move into another question. Uh, a sharp-eyed attendee asks this. How important is Lean to Good Scrum? I noticed Lean making a debut in the updated guide. And then, of course, he goes on to thank you and Ken for your work. So it is indeed true. Lean, the word lean makes a makes an official appearance in this guide. How important is it with doing really good scrum? Okay, a few years ago, a uh, senior manager, actually general manager of one of the biggest companies in uh, Japan, flew to Boston and he met me for a beer and he said, Jeff, I want you to bring scrum to Japan. I said, there's already scrum in Japan. You have trainers there. He said, they're not teaching the true scrum. I said, what's the true scrum? He said, the scrum of Professor Nonaka and Takjiuchi. The scrum that's in the paper where you got the name scrum, 1986, Harvard Business Review, new, new product development game. That is a paper about lean hardware companies. 100% of, of that paper is lean hardware companies. Hmm. And Takeuchi and Naka describe how the teams worked and they, it reminded them of the game of rugby. So they, they said, they're working so closely together, we're gonna to call that scrum. Now the senior manager said, my company is owned 20% by Toyota. 
we are going to be the trainers of Toyota. We have to bring a scrum into there that is actually better than lean. And what they're teaching now doesn't work. And he said, not only that, we want a joint venture with you, company, uh, which today they, they are the majority owners, but uh, we own part of it. And we are the trainers at Toyota for Toyota Research, for Toyota IT. And lean is, is a central piece of our training. And I teach, I, uh, we always taught that in all my scrum courses. So, you know, right now I'm thinking there's really four components. If you're going to go into a company like Toyota and you're going to elevate the, the best lean company in the world, <laughs> you need the scrum guide. You need lean tools and principles. You don't need everything, but you need some fundamental lean tools. Uh, single piece continuous flow, which is really the basis of the pattern swarming. So what I've done is put into these patterns, uh, these kind of things. So the patterns are extremely important. You cannot get people, people tell me, oh, patterns are optional. Okay, these eight patterns, if you don't have them, you will never get a team going five to 10 times as fast in your lifetime. And some people still argue to me, but nobody's been able to show me <laughs> a team that's going 10 times as fast that isn't implementing these patterns. <clears throat> so the guide, fundamental lean principles, the patterns, and then scaling needs to be part of the training today because what's happened is the scaling frameworks, I think this is even published in the Scrum Guide, at Intel, scaling frameworks were introduced and it slowed teams down. And then the agile leadership at Intel comes to me and they said, you're responsible for this Sutherland, you need to fix it. Because not only did the management throw out the scaling frameworks, they said, we do not wanna hear the word scrum ever again at Intel. So I said, we need to write down something that actually works at Intel. And, and I've heard you tell this story before, Jeff, and just, yeah, just yeah. to clarify, they weren't banning Scrum. It just, there was so much bad Scrum out there that they didn't right. want people using the name because it was like a blanket covering defects right. instead of actually using the framework. It was similar to what Henrik Nieberg found at Spotify, okay? He went into Spotify, they're doing Scrum and they have Scrum Masters, but they're, they're just following the rules and not getting the results. So we said, well, we're gonna change the name Scrum Master to Agile Coach. <laughs> so they had to change the name <laughs> to start getting the good Scrum results, right? So yeah. these are the kind of problems you run into. So we need, to, we need to teach Scrum Masters, Scrum Guide, basic lean principles, the pat, high productive patterns, and the fundamentals of scaling where you don't slow down when you add more teams. And Jeff, I'm sorry to say, we're going to have to leave it there because we've actually gone a little bit over and Scrum events start and end All on right. time. So let me say thank you very much and thank Jeff in particular. And thank you all for attending and celebrating 25 years of Scrum with us. And on behalf of myself, everybody who does Scrum, and I'm sure Jeff and Ken, thank you for all you have done to help make Scrum the most widely used Agile framework. We look forward to seeing what we can all accomplish in the future. Thanks again, Jeff. Thank you, Tom, and thank all of you out there that are working so hard on getting good Scrum into your organizations. And I appreciate all the feedback we've got, both positive and negative. We're trying to respond to your needs as best we can, and we hope the Scrum Guide helps.